Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's open line first Monday and it's, uh, I guess it's not really first Monday, but it's the first Monday that we're doing a live show this September. And it's actually the beginning of the ninth year of The Journey Home program. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's nine years worth of converts and reverts to the church. And, and uh, I appreciate all of you who've written letters and emails thanking EWTN for the program and uh, telling us how this program is an encouragement to your faith and of course that's why we do this is to help us appreciate this great faith that we have as well as help those who are outside the Catholic faith learn more about what the church truly teaches and uh, can be drawn by the Holy Spirit to the fullness of the faith. On this open line program I invite back former guests who you've already heard most of their story though they'll, uh, the guest will recount a little bit of it but we want to dedicate more of the time in tonight's program to your questions. So you're an essential part of tonight's program. If you'd like to call with a question, you can call with at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can call at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. My guest tonight is a guest you've probably seen a fair number of times on EWTN, Dr. Paul Figpen. Good friend. He's a member of the board of the Coming Home Network. Paul, Marcus. it's great to have you back. It's great always to be good. here. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Former charismatic, uh, non-denominational pastor, right? Uh, That's probably the best way to describe it. We just it. couldn't keep the list up there on one television screen. That was of all the churches that you had been involved with at one point, right? It was a long journey. We went looking a lot of places. That's right. All right. Let's, uh, every time we do the open line program. Now, th for the audience, Paul's entire story can be, it's written up on your website. That's right. That's right. And uh, yeah. we'll see that on the screen. Uh, I'm sure people at home can see it. But also, you were in Surprised by Truth 1. First chapter, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you'd like to see Paul's first appearance on the Journey Home program, you can go to the uh, EWTN catalog and download the your first appearance on the journey home. It's been a couple of years, right? It's, yeah, it's been a I think you were in the first right. year of Probably. the journey home program. Yeah. Yeah. But your paulthigpen.com is the website where they can get your full story. But give them a quick synopsis, a reminder of your journey. Well, I uh, essentially had two conversions. Well, we always have lots of conversions, I guess, but uh, I was born into the, the Presbyterian denomination. Was that until the age of 12? At the age of 12, uh, began reading some skeptic philosophers uh, that had been given to me, the text by a teacher, and uh, came to the conclusion that there was no God. So for six years I was an atheist all through my teenage years, until mm -hmm. I was 18. And then had a, uh, a conversion experience back to the Christian faith through uh, a number of things. I, I can't go into all of it, but uh, involvement with the occult, uh, bumping up against some various kinds of evil, but also uh, beginning to find, uh, going back to the scripture and beginning to find that that my heart's deepest longings were explained there and that I met someone there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I was in uh, a, a number of traditions. We were in the United Methodist Church for a while, the Assemblies of God, uh, several independent charismatic uh, fellowships, denominations if you want to call them that. Uh, I taught Sunday school in an Episcopal church. I was youth minister at a Baptist church. <laughs> we were looking and we were thirsty and hungry. And uh, long about the time that, uh, that I decided to to go back and get a PhD in church history was the time when, when the, uh, the claims of the Catholic Church began to be very clear to me, the claims. And I realized that I was going to have to deal with those. Uh, we all know, we've, we've heard the quote many times, <coughs> John Cardinal Newman, who said that to be deep in, in history is to cease to be Protestant. Right. And that did begin to happen to me. I, I still remember reading um, uh, a treatise by St. Augustine that I was reading for grad school uh, against the Donatist in which he was talking about the sin of schism, of breaking away from the church for the sake of trying to have a, <coughs> a pure church. And as I was reading, I was saying, that's right, that's right, that's right. And then all of a sudden, I, oh my Lord, I am a Donatist. He's writing to me. Sure. And um, so, so a number of events like that. But uh, church history, uh, uh, hunger for the Eucharist. I would visit Catholic churches to pray and had a sense that, that there was a presence there that I couldn't explain. And it was, I was haunted by the hidden God you might mm -hmm. say. So a number of things came together and uh, uh, it's, it's been 13 years now. It's interesting you mentioned conversion. I was recently <laughs> on a radio program, somebody confronted me about using the word conversion for our journey from non-Catholic mm -hmm. faith into the Catholic faith and 
there's a sense in which it's correct that we shouldn't use the word conversion for that technically, in a sense. But we use capital C, little c, I suppose, the way mm -hmm. to look at it. The capital C is our conversion to Jesus, and then we recognize our conversion to the Catholic Church is that continuation of that conversion because it isn't complete. And, we'll and I, the way I look at it is I'm still being converted. Yeah. So it's, it means to turn. It means to turn around. And we turn around from who we've been and become someone new. And that really did happen to me. I, I, I obviously don't uh, reject or, or uh, dismiss all that I learned in, uh, as an evangelical Christian right. before I became Catholic. I learned so much about worship and uh, the scripture and fellowship and so many good things. But uh, I found the fullness of truth in the Catholic Church. What can I say? You mentioned history, and I want to run with that a little bit. You're you're going to be one of our speakers at the Coming Home Network, uh, deep in history, deep in scripture, deep in Christ conference this November, first week in November, in case if you're interested uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and, and if anyone is interested in finding out more, they can go to our website. Uh, but we focus that conference on history. It's not so much an apologetics conference, which are great, you know, we love to defend the faith, but we recognize the need of the, the place of history in our journey. The first year we had the conference, it was kind of history in general. Last year it was on the early fathers. This year it's on the Continental Reformation, and you're going to, I think, speak on Luther. I won't go there yet. You're still working on the talk. But you mentioned the, the importance of history, and which, which you, when you said, I am a Donatist, I mean, that was a, an aha experience. Mm -hmm. through reading of history that the average non-Catholic doesn't experience. And it points to why being deep in history is so significant. What did you mean by that phrase? I'm a Donatist. The, it was, it was a, an early movement in the church, uh, centered in North Africa, uh, was, was quite extensive there by the time of St. Augustine, of folks who basically, without getting into all the details, had broken away from the Catholic Church in part because they thought the church as a whole was not pure enough. And they wanted to form a more pure, perfect society. And, uh, and I realized that all of my, my Christian, adult Christian life, that part of my search, part of being in a, in a mainstream denomination then leaving it for something smaller, for something more fervent, for something more committed, uh, and then breaking you know, from those and going to other smaller things, and that the history of since the Protestant Reformation to a great extent has been that, that folks uh, understandably with an ideal of wanting to have a more pure fellowship will break and break and break until finally splintered and we have more than 25,000 denominations. Yep. 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 But history, you know, history is so important f for the Christian faith because, because of the incarnation. I mean, that's why history can change your whole way of looking at your faith. If, if you're Buddhist, if you're Hindu, the, uh, the kind of philosophy behind those religions, the, the theology, what do you call it, a theology yeah. really, but can work within the system without having, making really any kind of historical claims. I mean, even if you're a Buddhist who believe that Buddha never lived, the teachings and principles would still work from your point of view. But the whole claim of the Christian faith yeah. is that God became a man. And then we look at what he became when he became a man and what he did and one of the things he did was to establish a church mm -hmm. and our entire connection to that that man in, in a kind of an objective way depends very heavily I mean we, we have prayer and mm -hmm. uh, the sacraments but depends very heavily on what history happened between his lifetime and ours has there been continuity or has there been a break was the tradition preserved in its integrity or was it lost and then someone came along and claimed to discover it, or some 20 people came along claiming to discover it, all disagreeing with each other about what they discovered. If, uh, the, the history is so important. Plus the fact that uh, there, was a, there was a Greek philosopher who once said that, the, uh, that history is philosophy teaching by example. And I like to adapt that to say church history is theology teaching by example. We learned, as with the Donatists, we learned so many times if we study church history what works and what doesn't. We, we look at the fruit of certain things and it, and it, it shows us where, where it is. If, if the principle, for instance, of, that Luther had of, of sola scriptura, that you, you really can on your own as an individual understand the scripture rightly with the help of the Holy Spirit without the church's help, then 
If that's true, then historically, you shouldn't have had the splintering even by the end of Luther's lifetime that you had. Yeah. Because all those people who were quite sincere, many of them quite sincere, same Bible in the hand, same Holy Spirit to help them, ended up with sometimes diametrically opposed interpretations of the same text. The history shows it's not a true principle. You're now, you, the Lord has opened up many doors for you since you become a Catholic to continue your very gracious. apostolic yeah. work. And I know that's one of the concerns often with clergy when you come into the church, what are you going to do? And not just to support your family, but to use the gifts that God has given you. And God's given you many options as a writer, particularly, Paul. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're a great writer and appreciate your work always. Um, I know a number of your books are available on the catalog in case the audience wants to check. But you're, within a year or so, you've become the editor of The Catholic Answer. It's been magazine. Years, right? Talk mm -hmm. about that magazine. What's oh, it's a great magazine. I'm so enthusiastic about it. I, uh, this is a magazine. It's published by our Sunday Visitor Publishing Company. And the whole point of it is to answer questions about the Catholic faith, about Catholic practice, and Catholic history, Catholic heritage. And most of the questions come from our readers, but we also get them from other sources. So we have a couple of columns that are Q&A columns, and readers write in and ask specific questions. It may be about liturgy, theology, all kinds of things. And, uh, and we have a columnist then that answer those questions, fine columnists. Uh, we have Margus Grodi with a column at the end. I have a, a column at the beginning. We have uh, a number of feature articles, and, and always the articles are focused on some particular question or group of questions. So for instance, September, October issue out now, the cover story uh, by Edward Sree is uh, Why Call Mary Queen? How many times have we had non-Catholics ask us, why would you call Mary Queen, mm -hmm. Queen of Heaven, Queen of the Apostles? And it's a very straightforward, biblically-based article that answers that question. This is why we do it. I noticed in that issue you had uh, a question that's probably common this, com this time of year, but uh, a lot of the audience may not think about writing in, uh, having the guts to write in about it to the what was that article that I'm talking about? Uh, you know what I mean? It's, yes, yes. It's uh, about this time, starting about this time of year and going through November. Uh, it seems like every year at TCA, we call the magazine, The Catholic Answer, the, we get the question, uh, what about ghosts? <laughs> you know, thinking about Halloween and that kind of thing. They say, How, do ghosts fit into Catholic theology? We got the question so much, I finally decided, well, I'll write an article to answer the question. It's in our September, October issue. Well, may you I want the you, answer? Well, well, <laughs> well, besides telling they need to go buy the magazine. Well, uh, yeah, they, that, for well, the I'm full answer, what, for the complete from a, answer. What's the difference in being a Catholic versus a non-Catholic in dealing with the issue of ghosts? In answering that question. The, the difference is the understanding of the communion of saints. You know, in a word, or in a few words, that's what it is. The, uh, it, it all depends. You have to start off defining the right way. The, the, the way we define in the article and in my answer is that if, if by a ghost you mean that uh, the spirit or soul of a human being that has separated from the body of that human being at death, uh, if that's how you mean, and you're not talking about poltergeists, that's a different thing, you're not talking about extraterrestrials, you're not talking about demons, but simply the human spirit that after death, uh, then yes, I mean, anybody who believes the basic Christian faith believes that there are ghosts because we believe that the human soul survives the death of the body, so it's detached from it. So every person who has died has, uh, you know, in that sense, unless they have their body back, as Our Lady does, they, at this point, you would say they're a ghost. So then the big question comes, and of course it's always the next question they ask, well, okay, if there is such a thing as a ghost, then do they show up on Earth? Is there such a thing <laughs> as a happening here? And, you know, that question from a Catholic point of view is easy to, to answer, too. It's in the scripture. Uh, let's to just start with the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, Elijah had been taken up into heaven with his body, so we'll rule that one out because we, we don't know exactly what was going on with him. But when Moses met with Jesus, his body was in the grave. That was his spirit, mm -hmm. being with Jesus. That's a ghost. Uh, so, yeah, we have that example. There's uh, you know, a debated example in the Old Testament where Saul calls up the spirit of Samuel, and people have debated whether or not it really was that or a demonic counterfeit. St. Augustine, I tend to agree with him that it really was. But in, in all these cases, there are... Um, uh, yeah, they can come, and then we have, again, the testimony of church history. You have yeah. people as recently as St. John Bosco giving a very clear testimony to an account in which he and a, a friend in seminary had agreed that if one of them died before the other, that he would, uh, if, they, if God would let them, they would somehow come back and give uh, testimony to the other that they had been saved. And sure enough, 
the day of the funeral after the uh, Bosco's friend died first. He's still in seminary the day of the funeral. That evening with 20 some odd seminarians all together in the same dorm room. A light, the door opens by itself, a light comes in and a voice says, Bosco, Bosco, I am saved. And as St. John said, uh, they talked about it for uh, weeks and almost nothing else. Now, I, mean, I give that an example because it's not, you can't count it off as, as yeah. legend or something. So it does happen. You, then you still have to get into the thing of, are there counterfeits? Yes. Should we be seeking that kind of thing? No. Um, you, you can't go to channelers or folks like yeah. you see on TV and that kind of thing. But the basic question is, yes, it is. We do have spirits that are separated from their bodies until the judgment day when their bodies are, are given back to them. And that God's, for his own reasons, sometimes allow them to come back. Yeah, sometimes it pushes us in the mystery of God. We don't always can't understand why God does some of these things. Uh, some, and some of the examples that, uh, there were a number of, uh, of priests, Jesuits and, and one uh, Benedictine that I know of, who studied this phenomenon, gathered stories uh, in the 1800s, the 19th century, from reliable sources of things that were reported. And it was remarkable how many times the way the the way it turns out that if it did seem to be a ghost that appeared, it was almost always a loved one of someone who came back and asked a priest or someone else to provide the sacraments or some counsel to someone left behind, and then it turns out that person died. And, and you know, all the circumstances are that mm -hmm. the one that showed up was someone who had been dead for years. So all I'm saying is that um, in God's providence, he apparently does allow for certain purposes for that to happen. But we shouldn't get caught up in it. Right. We shouldn't seek it out. We shouldn't glorify that. Uh, we should. We need to be very careful of demonic counterfeits. There are plenty of those, and poltergeist are another another matter altogether. Well, if any of you are interested in more about that, you can go to the Catholic Answer magazine. And uh, I know that as you mentioned in your article, you mentioned some of these other resources in case someone wants to find out more data. Let's go to our first caller, Ian from Florida. Hello, Ian. What's your question? Uh, my question is that uh, if a uh, Protestant is a guest in a Roman Catholic church, uh, they would not be allowed by the church to take communion. But if a Roman Catholic was a guest in a Protestant church, uh, they would be very welcome to take communion and be offered to them. And I'm just wondering why that is, because, I mean, for purposes, uh, you know, it's, it's not, well, it's not ecumenical uh, when that uh, it's not, uh, you know, reciprocated. And when I, uh, I happen by birth to be a Protestant, and, you know, but I do watch EWTN and, and enjoy watching it, and uh, I enjoy uh, listening to the priests, and uh, most of them, you know, seem to be, seem to be very ecumenical people, and uh, I, frankly, I feel it was up to them, uh, just to them, they, they would allow a Protestant to take uh, communion in a, you know, in a Roman Catholic church. So that's, that's my question. All right, Ian. Thanks a lot, Ian. Uh, Paul? Well, to, uh, to answer that, we have to first go to the heart of what communion is about for Catholics and, and, uh, and for Protestants, and it's different things I understand for different Protestant denominations. The Catholic Church, uh, first of all, understands uh, communion, the Eucharist, to be truly the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and his soul and his divinity, too, that, uh, that it's not just a symbol and that it's certainly not just a meal of fellowship or, or a memorial. It's, it's that too, but, but certainly not just that. And, uh, and also a, a sign, uh, uh, an expression of unity, unity of the church, and not just kind of a spiritual unity, but uh, an organic, uh, real, historical, institutional unity. Reasons for that go way back in church history. But uh, so when a, when a Protestant believer comes to a Catholic church, and of course they're always welcome to be there and uh, and to, to take part in the worship. They're, they're not able to come to the table of the Lord in the Catholic Church for several reasons. Uh, one would be that, and, and there's a biblical basis for this, that uh, if you recall, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about the dangers of receiving the body and blood of the Lord, the body of the Lord, if we're not rightly discerning the body. From the, the Catholic point of view, uh, for someone to, to come in who thinks that the Eucharist is something less than the real body and blood of the Lord, is not rightly discerning the body of the Lord, and that, that, uh, that's, that's problematic, that's, uh, and, and more than problematic, perhaps even spiritually dangerous. We don't know what all St. Paul was talking about there. He, he mentioned some people dying as a result. But, uh, yeah, so I'm not saying that someone's gonna die if they come in and take the, the Catholic Eucharist, but, but nevertheless, that rightly discerning what it is is first of all very, very key. 
The second thing is that because the Eucharist is, is not some hope or expression of a hope for unity, but actually is an act of unity, then from the Catholic point of view, because we don't have that institutional uh, organic unity with our, our brothers and sisters who are separated, that to have them take part in the Eucharist would be, uh, in a sense, a, 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 a deception of sorts, that we would be making a false statement by what we are doing because the, the unity is not there. Mm -hmm. And we pray for the unity. We, we hope for the unity. We believe, as Jesus said, that he wants uh, all of us to be one as he and the Father are one. And we, so we, expect, we hope for the day when that unity comes, but we cannot try to, uh, to anticipate it in a way that, that we go ahead and do something as if we were united when we're not. Um, I, sh I should mention, too, that also, although uh, uh, Protestants are, sorry, some Catholics are welcome in some Protestant churches to uh, receive communion, that for the same reasons we've just mentioned, that from the Catholic point of view, that, that the church uh, d does not allow that. But it's, uh, it's a very reasonable thing. It's a, it's a thing that breaks our hearts. I have relatives who, uh, as, as my heart is broken, that we can't together. And yet I understand the reasons for it and I accept that. Fact, I was thinking about this, that, um, and you're more trained in history than I am, Paul, that in the same way that if you look to the, the, wide, uh, the wide birth of non-Catholic Christian traditions, that over the last 150 years, they, many of them have adapted ideas that they would never have dreamed of proclaiming 150 years ago. Issues of lifestyle, issues of pro-choice issues that many of them propose that they would never dreamed of before, issues of divorce and contraception and a lot of issues of theology. Um, and where you find denominations now communing with one another that would never have dreamed communicating before. And I think this issue of the open communion table in Protestantism is fairly new historically. Because if you went back 150 years, even if even those groups that believed it symbolically still protected the table for their members that were in good standing in their church. I know that was true, for example, I used to be the pastor of the Church of Scotland, uh, the Covenanters, uh, for a year in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They had communion one time a year for one week. And it, uh, even by then, though, they weren't quite so strict. But it used to be that you could not receive that communion once a year unless you had the token that you'd receive from the pastor. So, I mean, this idea of kind of watering it down so everybody can receive is common to so many theologies out there. Which, is, uh, just to say, is that John Paul calls us to ecumenical work, but not at the compromise of what is true. And I pray for the day yeah. when we'll all be at the same, we will be all be at the same yeah. table, knowing that we receive the same body and blood of the Lord but it's not here yet. And that's our work behind this program, yeah, is to proclaim right. the fullness, so hopefully we'll all be sitting at the same table. Let's go to Vicki from West Virginia. Hello, Vicki, what's your question? Hi, love your show. Thanks. I'm a Protestant, mm -hmm. and I have become very interested in Catholicism. I've ordered a lot of books and tapes from EWTN, and mostly books that John Paul II wrote. Oh, yes. Um, Pope Benedict's books are very interesting, and I think, that he is just a marvelous person. Yep. So many of the Catholic traditions, our Methodist Church, we do the same way. However, there's so many things in Catholicism that I'm so interested in. It seems like that things on EWTN are fulfilling me more than I'm getting here. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, are there any other books or tapes or magazines mm -hmm. that I could be reading to have a better understanding of Catholicism? All right, Vicki, great question. My For guys goodness, that like much, love uh, books, I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> how much time do we have? Yeah. Uh, I, I know it can be difficult reading some, for some folks, but I always encourage people they want to learn more about what the Catholic Church really teaches, to take up the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a big book. It uh, can be a bit daunting the way it looks, but nevertheless, it is a, as, as Pope John Paul called it, a, a faithful, reliable compendium of, of the teaching of the Church. And I have met a number of folks from outside the Catholic Church who, once they picked up that book and started reading, 
or even went to the index and started going to subjects of interest to them to ask to ask of this book what what does the church teach they began to have that aha experience they said that's what that means or that's why the church does that or I thought the church believed this it actually means believes this and so you know there are many books that might claim to be Catholic that we you know, might not be able to rely on but you can rely on the catechism and that's why I encourage you so don't let the size of it intimidate you take a chapter at a time or go like I said go to the index and look at the question the, the topics of your your immediate In fact, interest. it makes me think of there's a book laying right here that you were involved <laughs> with well, and I know you're hesitant right. to be uh, self-promoting but tell them about this new book which well, is coming right here it's called the the new Catholic answer Bible this is a, a book that has uh, been put together in, in part because of the magazine. We've had questions over the years. And uh, so what we've done is we've taken uh, a copy of the Bible, a uh, version of the Bible, and we have added to it 88 inserts, one-page inserts, that answer many of the most common questions about Catholic faith and practice. And each answer is only one page, so it's a simple overview, and then it gives you scriptures and catechism references so you can go in for the for the deeper picture if you want but uh, it's it's available from our Sunday visitor I've been giving it out to all kinds of folks I think it's a great book it'll it'll probably start the, the, the inserts the questions that they answer will probably be the kinds of questions you have if you're looking at the Catholic Church all right and if you're interested you can go to paulthigpen.com anywhere else they ought to go for that or, or osv.com for this particular okay mm -hmm. osv.com mm -hmm. that will get you information on that all right thank you Paul Let's see who's our next caller. I, uh, I think we have a listing on that. Let's go to uh, Steve from Pennsylvania. Hello, Steve. What's your question for tonight? Hi, Mr. Brody and Dr. Thigpen. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is I have a relative who was Russian Orthodox, and then he converted to a Protestant denomination. He's gone to three or four different churches, and right now he doesn't go to any church at all. And when I see him, he always asks me, have you been reborn again? And I get upset, and the last time I told him, I said, I'm reborn every time I receive confession in the body and blood of Christ. And I I'm not sure just how I should answer him. Could you please uh, explain that this reborn concept to me? Steve has a great question, because I'm sure there's lots of Catholics that have <laughs> confronted with that and, and uh, have questions about it. Sure. The passage there in, in John that talks about being born again. Jesus asked Nicodemus, have you been born again? Nicodemus is confused, like a lot of folks are when the question is asked, how do I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus explains that, he, that you must be born anew, again, or the word can also be translated from above, by uh, water and the spirit. And that's a clue, should be a clue, and uh, Marcus and I were talking earlier about Bible verses that we never really <laughs> noticed when we were Protestant. That's one of them for me. That part that says we, it must be by uh, water and the Spirit. I never made the connection until I became Catholic and realized that this is a reference to baptism. That in baptism, we're of course, uh, the, the water, the form of the matter, of the, uh, the matter of the sacrament is applied, and the Holy Spirit comes to us then to, to cleanse us and to give us new life. That is that's the born again experience. And so every Catholic who's been baptized, every person who's been baptized has had that new birth. They are they're born into the kingdom, that's the gateway into the kingdom of God. Now, the, you know, the confusion is that in a number of evangelical traditions, that term has been taken to to apply to some kind of either emotional or intellectual experience or a combination in which a person who's old enough to know some have some sense of faith uh, will, as an act of the will, say yes to God. And that's an important thing. It's something we need to do all through our lifetime. But, uh, but the ancient tradition of the church is not that, that's, that the born again experience is that's what it's talking about. But that to be born again is to be born of the water and the spirit, to be baptized. So you've been baptized. If someone asks you, you've been born again, yes, you have. Yeah. And, but, but I like what you say, too, that because the receiving the, the cleansing of confession of reconciliation, the sacrament, and then receiving the body and blood of our Lord, that's, that's a whole new renewal as well. Yeah. It's, a, it's a new birth as well. So that's also a good answer. Because there's the, the part of it that says it's a fact through baptism that I've been born anew, but it's something we must act on. Well, when you're born, on. you're a baby, right? So yeah. what happens after a baby is born? It doesn't stop as a baby. It continues to grow. The child grows. That's what happens to us. The verse that uh, 
that uh, reminded me of is the verse from First Peter, where it's right at the beginning, where it says, um, to the exiles of the dispersion, chosen and destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with blood. And then it says, by His great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And it goes on and on. And then in the same book, later on he says, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Now that this isn't the same there, but the point is, he's talking about the connection of baptism and this mercy of God that gives us a whole new life in Christ. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who is in Christ is new. A new creation, the old is gone. I mean, that's a fact that you can claim if you've been baptized. That's right. But it's not something we should rest on. <laughs> We've got to live it's it out. It's the beginning. It's yeah. just the beginning. It's just the birth. Yeah. Jerry from Arizona. Hello, Jerry. What's your question tonight? Hi. Thank you. I really enjoy your program and all that you do. Keep Thanks. doing it. It's really important. Appreciate it. Uh, my question, and I guess <clears throat> you were talking about it. I didn't hear all of what you said, is a matter of interpretation. Uh, we're going through a crisis. My wife has terminal cancer, oh. and uh, she's had a real good spell. Uh, and we were with a family yesterday, Sunday, and we were talking about the rapture. And I was trying to explain to them the danger of the rapture. And, of course, my son-in-law says, well, that's your interpretation. And I try to give them the idea, and I'll try to explain it real quick, that the rapture says, you know, that Jesus will come and take all of my buddies and leave all these other guys here, that you won't die. And yet, I was trying to tell them that everybody dies. Even Jesus died. You know, you're not getting out of here. It's like going to your arithmetic class, and the teacher says two and two equals four, and you say, you know, is that a matter of interpretation? <laughs> or like Genesis, where God says, you know, don't eat the apple, and Satan comes and says, is that what God really said? Uh, the conversion story of yourself, and I'm reading from the book today, from the readings today, 1 Timothy 2, 1, 8, as I was listening to you all, and it's talking about the truth, and it finishes there, and I guess that's probably answering my own question, that when there's anger, uh, and you're not free of anger and you have dissension, I guess you can't be open to God's interpretation. Oh, if the anger is bitter in your heart. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting, the, uh, the monks, of the uh, the early desert fathers and mothers had a lot to say about anger and what it does to us. And the the image they used again and again was to to say that anger is like uh, an irritant in the eye of the soul. <coughs> that we have a spiritual vision in which we see ourselves, the way we see God, the way we see others. And that what anger does is it, it lodges itself like a splinter in our eye. And, and if we don't get rid of it, then the bitterness begins to cloud our vision until we can't see God, ourselves, or anything else uh, clearly. And they connect that to the, the parable where Jesus talks about, or the, the saying about taking the, the splinter out of your eye, or, or the, the splinter out of someone else's eye before the moat in your own. No, you have to forgive first and get it out. So I think that's true. I, I will mention, I, I have to say, that you, know, you brought up the, the rapture. I have a whole book about that. It's called The Rapture Trap, uh, published by Ascension Press. And, um, it's on the uh, religious catalog. Yeah, it's say. in that catalog. I, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to have them think at least a little bit about one biblical text. And that same passage in uh, the latter part of Matthew, Matthew 24, 25, where Jesus is talking about his second coming in the end. There's a very striking passage there. And, and Jesus says, uh, all those who are snatched out of the world will be saved. No, that's not what he says. He says, all those who endure to the end will be saved. And that's a that's very important thing to think about. You could look at all kinds of other Bible verses. You could look at the fact that all the way back to early times, the passage in, in 1 Thessalonians that rapture believers think is a, is a description of the rapture. You can see the fact that until only a couple hundred years ago, all, all the traditions, Protestant and Catholic, believed that that was simply a, dis, uh, a description of the second coming. There was no notion of a rapture for Calvin or Luther or Wesley or any of the Protestant reformers. But aside from all that, I would just encourage them to think about that verse. Jesus didn't say that those who are snatched out of the world during the time of tribulation at the end will be saved, but those who endure, endure to the end will be saved. All right, good, Paul, thank you very much. Let's take a break, when we come back, we'll first go to a, an email uh, from Ken in Massachusetts. We've got a couple emails and phone calls waiting. We'll back in just a moment with your questions.
Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Dr. Paul Thigpen. Paul, it's, it's always great to have you here. Let's go with this email from Ken in Massachusetts, and he writes, Hello, Marcus and Paul. A couple comments that you made prompted this question. Paul, you mentioned worship that you learned or were exposed to in other denominations before coming home to the Catholic Church and how you didn't leave that behind. What is the nature of these other forms of worship or types of worship and how do they differ from the notion of worship in the Catholic Church in these times? God bless you both and all at EWTN, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. That's, that's a great question. We could spend hours talking about that. I would say that what I, what I learned about worship, in, uh, especially in the church where I was associate pastor, was that primarily it was an encounter with God. It was an encounter with God. And that, uh, that I was to worship in spirit and in truth, I guess, to use the scripture version, uh, a reference to that the Jesus said. So I, I did learn that there, are, and looking at the Old Testament, that kind of thing, I did learn that there are, that it's possible to be caught up in forms of worship without the heart. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I also found, maybe not so much in that, that particular church, but in some other places, that there was a, a notion of, of worship that, that I can only describe as the entertainment model of worship. That the, the idea was to, to, that when you came, you judged how the quality of the worship or your, the quality of your encounter with God by how good it made you feel or how you felt afterward. I, uh, I laugh about it. I used to compare notes with another. I was a worship leader in our church when I was associate pastor, and I compared notes <coughs> with uh, another worship leader. And uh, he told me about one time how he, uh, he, he would get comments after one session where people would say, oh, I don't think the Holy Spirit was here today. And another time, oh, I think the Holy Spirit was here today. I could really feel it. And he couldn't figure out the difference. So he began to get a clue that maybe it had something to do with the volume. That, and these churches, we used <laughs> speakers and bands and you know, that kind of thing. So... Uh, so one Sunday, he turned the volume up louder than normal, and afterward got all kinds of comments from people saying, oh, yes, the Holy Spirit was there tonight. I really felt it. And the next week, he turned it lower than normal, and he got comments from people, oh, I just don't think the Holy Spirit was here today. I didn't really feel the worship. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's just an indicator. It's, it makes you smile. But, but so often in, in certain circles, in some of the circles I traveled in, there was the notion that worship uh, is judged, its quality is worship, uh, as worship is judged, its reality is judged by how it makes you feel. And so the, the notion was that you came to get. And one of the things I found in becoming Catholic was that, uh, that it is true, it, has to, it needs to be a hard experience, but that we don't ignore the body, uh, and more importantly, that we come to give. We come to give. And so even if we don't f happen to have happy feelings while we're doing it, even if we're going through a difficult time, and all we can do is to recite the words of the creed, the words of the prayer, and to sing, even though we don't feel at all like it. That nevertheless, that is also at the heart of worship. It is not just an encounter with God, but a giving of ourselves in the encounter with yes. God, and not expecting Him to make us feel good necessarily. I'll ask you about this, Paul, in relation to that. I, I just finished reading for the third time a wonderful book, which I highly recommend, by another uh, person who's on EWTN a lot, Father T Thomas Dubay his book, Fire Within, mm -hmm. which he pretty much summarizes the teaching of John on the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and, com and compares them to Scripture, uh, especially the Gospel of John. But he, he says something towards the end of that book in, in summarizing these spiritual writers, that when one understands whether prayer works, is prayer accomplishing what it's supposed to accomplish? What are we trying to do? How do we know whether my prayer is working? And he said often people are thinking that it's, again, an emo even prayer is an emotional experience. And so if it doesn't have this emotional experience, then my prayer isn't working. Or that my main goal is to be able to talk to God. So if I don't, you know, if I don't sense like I heard him, then my prayer didn't work or I didn't feel like I expressed it well. And he said, no, no, no. That what these saints say is that the way you know whether your prayer is working is whether you're growing in virtue. Hmm. Because that's what it's about. It's, it's, a, it's effect on you in holiness and humility. And is the same parallel there with the worship oh, yes. as we understand as a yes, Catholic? Yes, it is. And I think, I want to mention too, the difference between spontaneous, the spontaneous and, and formal worship. That, that was another, of course, big difference. I came from a charismatic tradition, very liberal uh, in its uh, approaches, very exuberant. Uh, that was all wonderful stuff. Uh, but I came to appreciate 
formal worship in the sense of worship with forms. Uh, I came to see them, I, I once called them anchors of prayer, that, uh, that if we depend totally, perpetually on spontaneity, that we're going to run out. Yep. <laughs> and not only that, that it often leads not just to an entertainment model, but a, a model of novelty where we, it's an idolatry of novelty. You're always looking for a new song, a new word, a new revelation, a new something. And after a while, you fall into patterns of your own liturgy. It's just that you don't know that they're there, and that makes it worse because then mm -hmm. you can't fix them. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so liturgy is so important because you are praying with the church. You have these forms. And, and the thing is, even charismatics will, <clears throat> uh, you know, and others will do it. They will sing in the words of the scripture or the words of another person, and they don't think that's a problem. Uh, because they put their heart into those words. Those words become the vessel of their heart. And it's the same way in, in any kind of formal worship. You take the forms and you put yourself into the forms, and the forms stretch you beyond and deepen you beyond where you are yourself. If you depend totally on spontaneity, you may have a, a, a worship service where you never do any confession. I've been to many churches like that where the, the people never make a corporate confession. And yet in the Catholic Church, because of the form, that's something you're going to do at every Mass, and it's a good thing to do it. All right, Paul, thank you. Let's take our next caller, Richard from New Jersey. What's your question tonight? How you doing, Marcus? I enjoy your show very much. Thanks, thank Richard. Thank you very much thank for uh, your show. I've learned a lot about the Catholic Church through your show. Thank you. Uh, my question is this. Um, what does the Catholic Church teach about uh, the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation chapter 7? Um, I know... Uh, some churches believe that only uh, unlimited amount of people go to heaven, and what they quote that scripture, which is 144,000, right. where a lot of other churches believe that everybody goes to heaven. So I just want to know what, how the Catholic Church interprets that scripture. Thank you, Richard. Good question. Richard, it's, uh, th I think the first thing we need to say is that, as to my knowledge, the Catholic Church has never definitively def uh, interpreted that particular text. So to ask what does the church teach about it, you can't say exactly the church has, you know, in X document has said this is what the 144,000 means. There is within Catholic tradition a number of ways of trying to understand the book of Revelation, which is understandably, you know, for most of us, one of the most difficult books to, to understand. It's uh, because so much of the language seems to, be, seems to be in code, seems to be highly symbolic, seems to be highly figurative. It's a part of a tradition of literature that you see in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel called the apocalyptic literature in which the, the main teaching of the book, the main point of the book, is to show that in the cosmic conflict between good and evil, between God and the enemies of God, that no matter how difficult things become on earth, that in the end, God wins. And that there is, so, so it's a literature of hope, even though it seems like a lot of people take it to be a frightening kind of literature, and they, they get the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and they try to speculate about all the horrors, and what does this mean, and what is the beast going to be? But the point of the book is, is to say however the beast appears in whatever, in whatever forms. And the church has talked about many antichrists. The Bible says, St. Saint, Saint John, in one of his letters says there are you know, many antichrists. Uh, that however the form comes, that in the end, God is triumphant. And if we are on God's side, if we are with God, then we will win through God even if we have to win through our own martyrdom. So this particular passage could be interpreted so many ways. The fact that it's 144,000 suggests within the tradition that uh, the symbolism of 12 is going on here. 12 is a number of fullness. We have 12, 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, and 12 times 12 is 144. So that's a number of great fullness. Multiply by 1,000, 144,000, and it means a really great number, a, a huge not just huge number, but a number of fullness, of completion. So the sense seems to be here that when we're talking about the 144,000 saints, it's not, as, as for instance, I think uh, Jehovah's Witnesses would believe that it's a, it really is 144,000 individuals that you can count and name. But rather than, it's talking about there is a great fullness and, and, and a, uh, of saints and that they will in themselves have a kind of completion, not just an abundance, but when, when it all is said and done, God will look at it and there'll be a completion, a perfection. And of course, one of the problems, you take any of those denominations that are trying to hold to a literal view of 144,000, eventually they have to balk on that. If, if their denomination gets bigger than 144,000, what do you do with the, then you, you're yeah, saying they, they that always end up with a struggle with that issue. Right. You know, so, and so yeah. they have, their interpretations always change. 
And uh, boy, we've got some great callers tonight. Uh, yeah. All the kind of questions you probably usually get in the Catholic That's Answer right. magazine. That's so right. let's take this email, dear Marcus and, and uh, Dr. Thigpen. Where is the proof of purgatory? And how do we know if we have sins on our soul when we die that we do not go straight to hell? How do I know that I will go to purgatory if I die with a sin on my soul? Matt from West Virginia. I think we have to understand, uh, first of all, what purgatory is about. And we have to understand that it is a process. It is, uh, it, the word means to purge, from the word to purge, to purify. And that it is a process that is going on from the time we become Christians. And we can respond in good ways or we can respond in ways that aren't so good. Uh, God has a purpose for us. When he cleanses us in baptism and then sets us on the road to salvation, his desire is that we become pu perfectly pure as he is pure, St. John tells us. And that's, that's the goal, that one day to be a saint, to be face to face with him in heaven and be just as pure as he is. Now we all know that we're not that way now and that most of us aren't that way when we die. If we look at life on this earth, we ask ourselves, all right, how does God help us to be purified? Does he wave a magic wand and superseding our will or, or doing an in run around our free will makes us pure? No, the way he does it, and he talks about it all through scripture, and we see examples of it in scripture, is that through adversity, through pain, through suffering, because we don't want to let go of these attachments, that we are purified. We, we learn to, to let go. We, it's, we're like rusty metal that has to have fire applied for the rust to go. And so that's what purgatory is. It is, it is that part of the process that takes place after death that purifies us. So to have a sin, uh, the stain of a sin is, is not going to, to send you to hell unless it's, it's mortal sin. And of course, that's a, another issue to go into. But the, the point is this, that if we're going to be in heaven face to face with God, we've to, we've got to become like him. St. John tells us that, the book of Hebrews tells us that. If the, at the point we die, we're not like him yet that way, then God doesn't wave a magic wand. We don't know what the timing is. I mean, at that point, you're really outside of time as we know it, we assume. So uh, does it all happen in an instant? Does it happen over time? We don't know. But what does happen is that we continue to be purified and that's what we call so purgatory. So we can stand before him without embarrassment, so can, as it says. And not just embarrassment, but so we can be like, you want right. to be like him. That's yeah. what else is there that's to right. be. That's right. We got a bunch of questions, mm, calls, okay. so let's see if we can uh, get as many in as we can. Elizabeth from Florida. Hello, what's your question? Elizabeth, are you there? Let's go to this email then. Maybe Elizabeth will come back. Hello. How can we answer a Baptist friend who questions us constantly on how we can put Mary on a pedestal? He says she is no different than we are, and we are wrong to pray to her. Is there somewhere we can find an answer? Thanks so much for your show. Jim Kay from Missouri. Well, Jim, again, there could be books about this. I, I think uh, there's several principles we have to help folks understand. One is that, uh, that all Christians ask for other Christians' help, and all Christians ask for other Christians to pray for them and to do what they can to help them. Uh, second is that, uh, that death is not enough to separate the members of the body of Christ from uh, the ones who are on earth, from the ones who are in heaven, or even the ones in the purgatorial process. So we are still able to ask for the help of those who have gone ahead of us. Third is that anyone who has been through the purification process and is now face to face with God has become like him, and, and Protestants will see this in the scripture as well, that they now share his authority, his wisdom, his love, his holiness, his power. We have those things promised in scripture that, that we will reign with him. We'll rule and reign with him and share his authority and, and all those things. We will become like him. So anyone who is a saint in that sense, the fully perfected saint in God's uh, presence there in heaven, has a share in his power and, and ability to help us. So do we refrain from asking them simply because they're in heaven. Can they hear us? Well, of, of course they can. If God can hear us, he can either make it possible for them to hear or they share in that power of his. But finally then, to get to the question about Our Lady in particular, Mary, uh, it really isn't true that she's just like the rest of us. Uh, the, the Catholic Church teaches and, and has affirmed from the beginning that in view of the merits of her son as, as something fitting for her son, that she was conceived and born without sin. And that doesn't mean she didn't need a savior. She did need a savior. It was Jesus' merits that made that possible. 
so that she is different, but, but also different in that she bore God in her womb. Jesus was God and bore God in her womb. And as we have on the cover story of the, the magazine we mentioned, because she is the mother of King Jesus, that makes her the queen mother. In, uh, in Old Testament times, <coughs> David didn't have one of his wives as, as queen. Bathsheba was, didn't become queen mother until her son, or didn't become queen until her son became king. So Mary is, she has a special role in heaven. She's the queen. All right, well, we've got lots of great questions right. here. Let's see, let's go Bob from New Hampshire. Hello, Bob, what's your question? Well, hi, Marcus, yep. good to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, you you've got a great program, I uh, so always find it very interesting. Uh, what I have is a question, a comparison question between, let's say, Protestants and Catholics. Um, very often you see TV evangelists will talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as growing up as a Catholic, that was never in my vocabulary at all. Okay, <laughs> Now, really, uh, you know, it's just as alien to me. Uh, Christ is not, but that phrase, personal relationship, I've looked in the Bible, I don't find it. And so my question really is, is it in the Bible? And what is the history that, that gave us into this this phrase which is popular on TV. All right, Bob, great. Bob, that's, uh, you know, you're right. It's one of, it's a kind of jargon, especially used in, among American evangelicals, and there's a point for it. They, they make a good point with it. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You, I don't think you'll find that kind of language that way in the scripture. When, a, when an evangelical uses that language, what they, what they typically mean, I know what I meant when I was an evangelical, uh, is this, that is, is God just an abstract to you or a thought or like a piece of furniture that you've inherited from your family? Or is God really someone to you? Is God someone that you talk to? Is God someone who is friend and also master? Is God someone that you expect to do, to do things to you and for you and to help you and, uh, and to talk back to you, someone that, that has something to say to you? Uh, do you have, uh, does God love you? Does God delight in you? All the things that a person does makes, you know, the, that we recognize that God is not an abstract, God is not an idea, or any of those things, but that he really is a person, not a human being in that, that sense, but a person. Someone with a, an intellect and a will, and who loves and cares and all those things. And so for, for evangelicals to say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus, is another way of saying, is God real to you? as someone who loves you, cares for you, is involved in your life, and God especially in Jesus Christ, and, and as he is incarnated in Jesus Christ. And if you understand the question, then, you know, if you're a faithful Catholic, you can answer it, oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> I talk to him all the time, he helps me, he guides me, he speaks to me through his word, he gives me his body and blood in the Eucharist, he is reconciled, he reconciles me to himself through the sacrament of reconciliation, and on and on, so many other things. So I, I would say, you know, once you understand what someone's asking when they say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You can say, oh, yes, I, I am. I love him. He loves me. Yeah. And in fact, the, the parallels are there because from a Protestant perspective, you can go to church every Sunday. You can be a member of the church and not have a personal relationship because, like you said, God is merely something you kind of inherited. The same thing can be true of Catholics, right? right? I mean, you can say the Liturgy of the Hours faithfully and not have a personal relationship with God, or you can have through what goes on in your heart, in your mind, mm -hmm. through your commitment to Christ, you know, that involves with your surrender to Christ. So, I mean, and to see the surrender is so important because yeah. that's that aspect. You can have a, you can believe that God is a person, but if you're mad at him about something, if you've broken the relationship, if sin has gotten in the way and you haven't repented, that relationship's broken. And, and so in a sense, you don't have a personal relationship at that point, or at least it's a broken one or if you, uh, if you turn your back on him. It's the same way if, you know, what, what kind of a friend would you be if, if I never talked to you if, and you never talked to me? If, That's why I bring you all the way down to EWTN That's so right. I can shake hands with That's you. Right. <laughs> Paul, it's always good to have you with us. It's God a pleasure. Paul. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. It is always a pleasure. Until next week, let's see, make sure that God guides us as we nurture our personal relationship with God through prayer and the sacraments and the great church he's given us. God bless you. See you next week.